Uh, very good evening to one and all. Uh, so today we are starting a series of sessions which will be a, a revision classes for, for your upcoming prelims. So the plan is we have six sessions in the next three weeks. Every Monday and Friday we'll have sessions in the evening, uh, five to eight. So it is in these sessions we will be covering subjects such as polity, science and tech, places in news, economics, okay, and international organizations, environment. So all those subjects where there is a relevance of current affairs. And the time period of coverage would be the last one year's current affairs, right? Starting from last year's uh, June onwards. But even though I may say that it starts from last year's June, syllabus will also extend to events that have taken even six months or a year before that as well, because there is always a connect in the sequence of events, right? So we cannot strictly compartmentalize, but at least last one year's current affairs is what we intend to cover through these sessions. So as you can see, we have six sessions and every session will cover about 14 to 16 or 17 themes, right? Approximately 15 themes per session. And the nature of the session is such that we will have 30 questions per session. Okay, so it will be a, a, a question and answer kind of a session. The reason is because when we take some 14 or 15 themes, we cannot complete the discussion of all 14 and 15 themes within a span of three hours. Because let's say anti-defection law is a, a topic of current affairs. Just to have entire discussion on anti-defection law will take at least one and a half hours or two hours. So it would not be practically feasible to just start covering every topic and revise it for you. So that's why the session proceeds in a question and answer format where a question is displayed and the, all the questions that are chosen have some relevance with current affairs. The questions are of two types. One is it could be some aspect of current affairs itself which may be framed as a part of the question or otherwise it may test the fundamentals and concepts underlying the current affairs. The reason is at least in polity, uh, since we start today with a polity session, uh, at least in polity, if you analyze the last two or three years of questions as how it is asked in the prelims of uh, in the prelims, you will not find many questions. Let's say out of 10 questions, at least eight questions will be testing the fundamentals and concepts underlying something that happens in current affairs, right? Directly current affairs does not find uh, asked as a question in polity at least. So that's the nature of questions that I have prepared for the session today, where we I will introduce you to 15 different themes of current affairs and what possible questions that tests your awareness about those themes, plus whether you are very thorough with uh, the concepts underlying those themes that will also be tested through these questions. So these questions are to indicate to you that this is what has happened. This is how probably UPSC can frame questions. And it's a platform for you to test whether you are competent enough to handle a similar nature of questions like how it is going to be asked in your upcoming prelims. Okay, all 30 questions, I would categorize them as a above average level of difficulty. None of the questions are simple as such, but if you find it simple, that is really good. You are on the right track. But even if you're not able to get these questions mostly right, there's nothing to lose heart about it because as I told you, it's all either average or difficult. That would be the level of difficulty of all the 30 questions that I have framed. Uh, because you see in polity, definitely out of total questions, 60% questions in polity and constitution will be very simple questions. Okay, so there is no point of asking those simple questions again. It's a waste of your time as well as my time. So that's why all the questions have been prepared so as to give you an exposure to the remaining 40%, the difficulty, difficult kind of questions which possibly can be asked would be of this nature. Okay, so even if you can get those 60% of the easy questions right, if you can get 50% of the questions here in the discussion today right, you are very well on your way to clear problems. So it's not expected that you should get all the questions here correct. That is not our expectation. 50%, very good, I would say. Right. So I think we can proceed to the session and uh, you can type in your response. Okay, whatever questions are asked, you can type in your response to my chat ID on Zoom. So I am logged in as Satya Krishnan. So I hope uh, all of you can uh, send your responses to me. Is it enabled? Send them. Uh, can they re respond back to me? Okay. Can you all please try, uh, send a response to me? My, I'm logged in as Satya Krishnan. Okay, so, so okay, I'm getting a message saying chat is disabled. Is it so?
have they enabled the chat can you please uh, type in a good good evening message or uh, q and a is enabled okay so if not please send your response in the q and a box okay if not a chat can only ask through q and a yeah even q and a is fine so just post your answers through q and a all right so let's get into the session i'll start asking you questions so these are all the areas which i found to be relevant for the upcoming years prelims so i believe all your current affairs are focused around these topics right so we have we anti defection law which is a perennial issue every year there is always some kind of a legal complication uh, in the judiciary about anti defection law okay it's a evergreen topic and this year also we have uh, a case regarding anti defection law which has been referred to a constitution bench in supreme court that is the maharashtra udhav thakre issue right shivsena issue so anti defection law is a part of it then topics related to fundamental rights secularism right so the state intervention to ban hijab in schools uniform civil code so these are all the certain themes that will be discussed in today's session and election lot of events have been happening around election commission and representation of people's act in the last one one and a half years so there are some three or four questions regarding election commission rpa in the slide and uh, supreme court's powers functions uh, for example collegium system is often discussed the propriety of collegium system should there be a, a, an alternative system to replace the non transparent collegium system so that is something that we find commonly across news these days so you find that as well and some bills latest amendments which have been carried out to certain legislations maybe four or five different uh, legislations which we will be touching upon plus certain non statutory bodies uh, statutory bodies which are prominently in news like cbi enforcement directorate right so those bodies will also be discussed and a very important topic five years once it happens election to the office of president of india so we have that as well so i find these are the different topics around which there have been some kind of current affairs which have happened in the last one one and a half years so i would request all of you to possibly if possible take a screenshot of this even if you cannot note down the topic one by one a screenshot would also suffice take it so that uh, even after the session you can browse more about these areas this would give you a focus on what more to explore okay so this can be done all right so we'll move on to the first question i hope all of you are ready so what you do is you take a piece of paper uh, write down 1 2 3 4 up to 30 so if you know the answer just mark a b c d if you don't know just leave it blank and immediately after the question i'll give you the answer as well so if you are right mark it right if not mark it wrong and finally evaluate how much do you get okay so we'll start so the first theme is regarding elections okay and what what regarding elections supreme court has passed an important judgment that imparts some kind of an independence to the functioning of election commission of india the process of choosing the election commissioners has become much more inclusive now it is not only going to be controlled by the executive alone but we have the member from the legislature as well and as well as a collegium comprising of chief justice of india so that is something that we can discuss about elections and uh, various current affairs regarding functions of election commission of india for example election commission has decided that it is the eknath shinde faction of shiv sena who are the real shiv sena right so that is one function of election commission when there is a dispute between a political party who has a claim over the party it goes to the election commission and gets decided so there is some news around it right so we have some issues and not only that some amendments have been done to representation of people's act as well okay so these are all some current affairs that has happened so based on that the questions follow so this is the first question okay consider the following statements regarding election commission of india and you have three statements so you can type in in the question and answer box what are the uh, what is the right answer
okay we have multiple answers many correct answers as well the right answer for this question is option c okay this is the correct answer first of all you should know what is the objective of indrajit gupta committee okay we cannot go into the details of every committee regarding elections and we cannot go and memorize each and every committee's recommendations and everything okay but broadly you should know that dinesh goswami committee is about electoral reforms okay it is about changing the composition of election commission imparting more independence to election commission and many other uh, changes to rpa 1950 51 were all recommended by goswami committee whereas indrajit gupta committee regarding election its only purpose is on electoral spending how to reduce expenditure re with respect to elections that was the only objective so the entire committee's recommendations only revolves around those issues it does not go into the composition of election commission or anything okay so this is a fact even if you do not know that still you can get the answer right if you know that as of now there are no powers of eci to fix ceiling limits on political parties the 95 lakh ceiling limit expenditure incurred by a candidate on lok sabha elections the 40 lakh ceiling limit on candidates for state legislature elections that's all ceiling limits only applicable for individual candidates and not for political parties so by knowing that this is not possible you should be able to eliminate two okay so this is gone all the above is also gone either you have one and three or three so three is correct okay even then you are left with two options so it's only with the knowledge of the first option whether it is right or wrong you will get the answer right so first answer uh, first question the correct answer is option c three only this is there uh, in section 11 of rpa 1951 okay there are so many grounds on which a person can be disqualified from contesting elections criminality is one such ground section 8 talks about if you are convicted for any offense for which the period of punishment is 2 or more years okay in that case you are disqualified for the next 6 years correct so that is one ground disqualification on grounds of corrupt electoral practice is another ground under rpa 1951 for disqualifying candidates from contesting elections similarly there is also another ground which is disqualification on grounds of non filing of election expenses okay that can also be a ground of disqualification so who does the disqualification for non filing of election expenses alone eci is the competent authority whereas other disqualification it is not eci it is done by the president okay on corrupt electoral practice disqualification on conviction for offenses president is the competent authority whereas when it comes to non filing of election expenses the appropriate authority to disqualify a person happens to be the election commission of india all right so this is right uh, so option c is the right answer i don't think upsc will ask a direct question on who are the authorities who will elect who will choose the election commissioners okay and three authorities will be given prime minister leader of opposition chief justice it's a very simple question everybody will know the answer so upsc will if at all it asks a difficult question it only go to the peripheral area surrounding elections and it may ask and one such question is this all right okay we move on to the next question so this is the question number 2 who among the following can remove the disqualification of a member disqualified from contesting elections under section 8 of rpa 1951 okay basically why i have taken this question is because of rahul gandhi's disqualification right it is a recent current affairs so most probably it will capture the attention of upsc right and uh, now on appeal the disqualification itself has been stayed but uh, still there has been an order disqualifying rahul gandhi fr from his membership of lok sabha right so who can remove the disqualification once a person is disqualified on uh, using section 8 of rpa 1951 so who is com competent authority okay president supreme court on election petition c c c c a a okay all these are wrong answers the correct answer is election commission of india okay removing the disqualification the powers under rpa 1951 is only in the hands of election commission of india and that too 
for every other disqualifications other than disqualification on grounds of corrupt electoral practice for uh, if a person is disqualified on grounds of corrupt electoral practice there's no way the disqualification can be taken removed for other disqualifications yes it is po possible and the power is conferred in the hands of election commission of india as per rpa 1951 okay it is not the president supreme court on an election petition election petition is only to decide on election disputes between two candidates who have contested elections supreme court has no role in uh, disqualifying a person or removing a disqualification supreme court has a role only in conviction for offences later once convicted president issues an order of disqualification so removing that period of disqualification this is what happened in the year 2019 when the sikkim chief minister the former chief minister of sikkim he was convicted on graft charges on corruption charges he was disqualified for 6 years but the election commission had removed the period of disqualification then it became a controversial issue as that can set a wrong precedent it makes a mockery of the entire law itself so there were a lot of discussions going on surrounding that so as per rpa 1951 the competent authority to remove the period of disqualification is election commission of india okay now we move on next question so correct answer eci Question number three: What are the benefits available to political parties registered with the Election Commission of India under RPA 1951? So let's see how many can get this question right. சாட் கொஞ்சம் எனேபிள் பண்ணி விடுங்கப்பா இங்க கொஞ்சம் டஃப்பா இருக்கு சாட் கொஞ்சம் பார்த்து சொல்றேன் ஓகே ஐல் गिव द ரைட் ஆன்சர் फॉर திஸ் क्वेश्चन बेसिकली ஆல் தீஸ் ஸ்டேட்மென்ட்ஸ் ஆர் ஆஸ்ட் வித் ரெஸ்பெக்ட் டு ஆர்பி 1951 ஓகே திஸ் இஸ் ரிகார்டிங் தி பவர்ஸ் அண்ட் ஃபங்க்ஷன்ஸ் of election commission in registering political parties this is basically a question on how rpa tries to regulate political parties as such so we have section 29 of rpa 1951 which deals with political parties okay and when you read section 29 of rpa 1951 it says any party even without getting themselves registered with election commission can also contest elections it is not mandatory that a political party should be registered with election commission okay tomorrow i can form a political party without even getting it registered i can still contest elections but only if i get myself registered with eci i can avail certain benefits the need for registration is to comply with transparency norms okay because once i get registered with election commission i have to follow whatever election commission dictates upon the functioning of political party i have to make certain disclosures i have to be compliant with certain practices so as to no so let the voter get informed about where i get my funds where i spend my funds right so election commission will have some supervision over me if my political party is registered with election commission okay so as per section 29 of rpa 1951 first statement is right only if a political party is registered with election commission of india it can receive funds from corporate in, uh, from uh, entities private entities okay i think now the chat box itself is enabled so i request you all, all to type in the chat box okay question and answer it's not convenient for me to go scroll it see if the chat box is enabled and yes okay all right so the first statement is actually correct okay only registered political parties can receive contributions from private companies the statement is right okay this is right candidates of such parties are entitled to the use of reserved symbols in lok sabha elections no reserved symbols are only given to recognized parties okay not for every registered party so only for national and for state parties parties which are recognized as either national parties or state parties 
only they are entitled to use of reserved symbols not simply for registered parties and this is also given only for recognized parties and not for registered parties it's only for national parties and state parties which are so recognized by election commission during the time of elections a copy of electoral rolls will be freely provided by the election commission for individuals as well as for candidates belonging to registered parties they cannot get this facility right so these are all some of the features of rpa 1951 so the correct answer for this question is one only okay so from election part we have uh, three questions and these are the answers all right so we'll move on more to the next area next theme is regarding presidential elections uh, last year in the month of july the presidential elections were conducted mrs draupadi murmu was elected as the president of india so uh, i don't think upsc will ask you question as in what is the electoral method for electing president of india proportional representation single transferable vote such easy questions don't think upsc will ask and already in the past in one of the prelims a question regarding the vote value of mla mp that was also exhausted right so when we think about what possible more areas can be asked as questions upsc can probably ask certain interesting facts about presidential elections because upsc has asked such kind of facts in the past like mr devilal had contested from more than two constituencies you know that was one prelims question of the year 2021 prelims so upsc can play with certain facts as well so regarding presidential elections i have uh, taken two questions one which tests the procedures that are involved in presidential elections okay so this is the question consider the following statements in the context of election petitions filed after elections to the office of the president of india so basically election petitions are filed to challenge the correctness of the outcome of elections presidential elections okay so based on that this is a question that has been framed let me see how many can get this answer right okay right uh, some of you have got the answer right the petition should be filed within a period of 45 days is wrong it should be filed within a period of 30 days and not 40 days okay whereas when it comes to election petitions for elections to lok sabha state assembly and all you have a 45 day period after the results are declared you have 45 day period but when it comes to presidential election where is it given is it given in the constitution itself no the constitution does not talk about the fine nuances of presidential election it is left to the act of parliament so parliament has made the election to the office of president and vice president act we have a separate act for that purpose it is that act which governs all these areas okay so the election petition should be filed within a period of 30 days and not 45 yes election petition can be filed by the candidate as well as the seconders proposers okay those who back the presidential candidate who express their support no the 50 members who are the proposers of a particular candidate so any of those uh, sorry sir not proposers any elector so it is the elected mp and the mla from the electoral college any member can present an election petition same is the case with the election petitions for election disputes in lok sabha state assembly election let's say i contest a lok sabha election i lose the elections i can file the election petition or any of the elector of my constituency can also file right same is the case here also the presidential candidate or it could even be the electors to the presidential election who are not none but the mlas and the mps right so they can also file the election petition so this is right the petition can be presented before supreme court only this is correct this is given in the constitution itself only supreme court has the exclusive juris jurisdiction to try disputes regarding elections to the president of india right so two statements are correct so two two statements only option is b b is the right answer so this can be one way of how upsc can make the question regarding presidential election slightly on the difficult side so now we move on let's see how many can get this question right
the chat box has been enabled so please type it in the chat box okay don't type it in the question and answer section okay let's say the first statement is a fact okay this is a fact and we are not very sure about it constitution of india prescribes 50 electors as proposers while a candidate files nomination papers this is not given in the constitution of india it is given in the elections to the office of president and vice president act okay not provided in the constitution the number can be easily changed initially there was no concept of proposers i think it is only in the third or fourth presidential election slowly the concept of proposers came into existence because a lot of non serious candidates started filing nominations for presidential elections okay so that is why to discourage such non serious candidates the concept of proposers was brought into existence so not given in the constitution okay and neelam sanjeev reddy was the only candidate to be elected under post to the office of president of india is a correct statement he was the only person who was elected to the office of president under post okay and first question you should know the timeline okay radha krishnan was the first second president sorry uh, sorry uh, that is rajendra prasad for the uh, third time so possibly in 60s radha krishnan would have uh, contested elections okay but fakruddin ahmed is in the later period during the emergency and during those time so there is no relationship between these two people at all okay so they were presidents at very different points of time so there is no way you can use such kind of logic also if you do not know the exact fact okay so select the correct statements so three only is the correct answer for this question okay all right we move on so these are who knows upsc can ask these kind of facts also in question in the, in the examination okay out of all these different ideas even if there is one statement in the real exam the purpose of this discussion is not to predict or to anticipate this is how upsc this is exactly the upsc questions that is going to have you are going to face no it's not that we get exposed to broad areas different different areas surrounding the topic so that even if there is something which makes you feel the question in prelims is familiar to you that itself will get you give you a lot of confidence all right there is no guarantee that these questions are going to replicate in prelims but uh, there is no harm in discussing all possible variations from based on which questions can be asked okay and third the next theme is about clemency powers of the president we have had a lot of issues going on with respect to this rajiv gandhi assassins right pay revalence case where the president uh, was delaying disposing the mercy petition the supreme court had to intervene and rectify the injustice so finally supreme court used its powers under 142 and it left pay revalence to go free right so this sparks a debate on uh, what is the correct prompt use of president's clemency powers so based on that a few questions have been chosen so let's see if you can get this answer right okay one correct answer up to now not many right answers see article 20 is basically a protection against double jeopardy right you cannot be convicted for the same offense twice you cannot be punished for the same offense twice it's simple okay first an accused acquitted by a lower court being convicted by a higher court on appeal it's a part of the same case the court is yet to punish you okay the it's not two different cases not two different instances when the same offense is being tried no first court has not even punished you it has acquitted you completely okay but there can could be error in the way the case was disposed so the state would have gone on an appeal so it's not that a second trial is being taken up no 
the correctness of the first trial is what is being examined by the appellate court so this would not amount to double jeopardy okay so first statement no it's a part of the same trial only it's not that you are once again subjected to a second trial okay and this is also not an example of double jeopardy because there could be mistake there could be gross procedural violations in the lower court which leads to injustice being given so that is why the correctness of the procedures of the lower court is challenged in high court or in supreme court and since the procedures were not followed properly the outcome of the case itself was completely quashed and a trial once again starts okay it's not that punishment was given and a second time another new punishment is going to be given or anything okay so these two do not amount to double jeopardy in the first place so it is not violative of article 20 whereas supreme court has clearly mentioned in many cases okay even in rajiv gandhi assassins case the supreme court's line of judgment was they are death row convicts they have been given death punishment in 92 or 93 and they have filed their mercy petition and the mercy petition has been pending for 26 27 years so basically they have served two life imprisonments right almost two life imprisonments they have served and now if their mercy petition is denied rejected if they are now put to death that would amount to double jeopardy once you are punishing them with life imprisonment and now you are punishing them with death so that is why supreme court had commuted their punishments okay so yes inordinate delay unexplainable malafide delay okay in dealing disposing mercy petition this would definitely amount to violation of article 20 okay so 3 only is the correct answer all right we move on okay power of pardon available to the president of india Okay, no right answers until now. It's all wrong. Okay, you all know this is a wrong statement. Both are powers given under Constitution. One is Article seventy two, other one is Article one sixty one. So these are constitutionally sanctioned powers in the hands of the head of executive of both the union and the state governments. Okay, first statement is wrong. We eliminate this. Okay. second governor cannot grant pardon to death row convicts there is a recent supreme court judgment in the month of 20 21 august i think where supreme court has clearly given a judgment that the power of granting pardon also lies in the hands of governor just that the death should have been given under a state law not under a union law i know this is uh, something contradicting contradicting with your lakshmi kant but uh, this is what is the recent supreme court judgment maybe you can have a look at it okay supreme court is very clear it's, it has said that governors do possess the power of granting pardon even to death row convicts just that if the punishment was given under state law okay so this is a correct statement sorry this is a wrong statement governor cannot grant pardon wrong third a mercy petition once rejected by the president can be petitioned before the governor of the state yes that is correct this is the outcome of maruram this is union of india okay in the maruram is union of india the supreme in this case the supreme court has clearly given a judgment saying that just because one executive uh, one head of the executive see there are two different governments one is the center the other one is state right just because one authority has rejected doesn't mean that the other authority should not be petitioned with mercy petition okay so let's say i commit a crime and i am punished under a state law i am given death punishment or i am given a life imprisonment punishment okay so i can if it is a state law i can only file before the governor right okay or let's say it's a punishment of death if it's a punishment of death i can file a mercy petition before the governor as well as the president okay let's say i file before the president president has rejected my mercy petition still i have remedy in the form of filing a second mercy petition before the governor so this is a an outcome of maruram's case all right so third statement is actually correct 
So three only is the right answer. So we move on next area. Okay, a lot of uh, discussion debates has been going on with respect to all these areas. Okay, about uh, the rights of minority groups of people, sexual minority, religious minority. Okay, and uh, homosexuals. So let's have some discussion about that. We'll see the question, and based on that, we'll have further discussion. Which of the following international human rights instrument explicitly recognizes the right to privacy? Uh, Puttaswami judgment had given a lot of clarification on the position of right to privacy, whether it is absolute or can it be interfered with the, by the state, right? But uh, I, I don't think any questions have been asked about privacy in the last two years, okay? Maybe there was one question asked about right to privacy forms a part of which article, article 19, 17, 21, one such question was asked, but uh, beyond that, uh, no tricky questions were asked by UPSC. Okay. So this could be one such tricky question. Which of the following international human rights instruments explicitly recognizes the right to privacy? And let me tell you, you can get the answer right, even though you may not know any of these international instruments. You have to think about the concept of privacy and which fundamental right is it related to. Based on that, you'll be able to get this right. Okay, many right answers. The answer is one and two. Okay, privacy is an essential part of liberty, right? So, when it comes to liberty, liberty from whom? It is from the state, You, a citizen has to be protected, right? The state should not be very intrusive in interfering with the individual. Because whatever phone calls I make, if the state is able to have a record of all that, there's always a fear which will prevent me from raising my opinion against the state. I always have a fear that what the state exposes me, correct? So in that case, I will not even be able to speak frankly, openly against the, critically against the state. So I'm not able to exercise my political and civil rights, right? The freedom of speech and expression is a part of political civil rights, which is all a larger part of human rights, correct? So with that thought, you can get Yes, if it is a, an instrument on human rights, definitely there is a possibility that it should be there. Civil and political rights, definitely it is there. In both these international instruments, you will have very similar provisions to our chapter on fundamental rights. You will have the freedom of speech and expression. You will have the freedom from arbitrary arrests. Okay, similarly, you will have the freedoms, at least in our constitution, the right to privacy is not explicitly given anywhere. It has been brought in because of certain case laws. It has been made as a part of Article 21. But uh, all these international instruments and all, right to have a private life, right to be not interfered into one's personal life by the state, these are all explicitly given provisions because these are Western democracies where the consciousness of individual rights is even more stronger. Correct? So that is why you will find both one and two having provisions regarding privacy. It's I don't think it is... You can only think commonsensically, okay? So right of child is something different. For a child, we cannot really th think about privacy and all that. Privacy is a concept, I think, which we apply only to adults, okay? Not completely for child. Maybe, yeah, for child protection, protection from being stigmatized. Uh, we save the identity of victim from being disclosed and all that. But uh, these kind of, there is no explicit mention of right to privacy as such in any of these other instruments only in these two we do have one and two right. so we move on next this question has been taken up in the context of the demand that is currently ongoing regarding homosexuals right to also have a marital life okay so because special marriage act only recognizes the right of individuals of two different communities male and female to marry each other the word person as given in special marriages act does it involve two persons belonging to the same sex or not. It is now up to the Supreme Court to interpret and give a solution. So based on that, this question has been chosen. Okay, let's say if you can get this right. Both, okay, yay. Yeah. 
see this we may not know but we can only guess okay there is a possibility that right to marry might find a place in the most important international document on human rights okay universal declaration of human rights of the un it is as an inspiration from that many other countries have made their respective chapters on fundamental rights so there is a possibility so we can only go for go in such a way and get it right okay in india it is not simply a legal right but after supreme court court judgments it is also a part of article 21 okay so it is not it may not be explicitly mentioned in the constitution but it has been recognized by supreme court as a constitutional right nobody can deny any person the right to marry of their own choice okay because it has been now made as a part of article 21 in various judgments just that whether it also applies to homosexual couples or not is the question now before the supreme court okay it may not be explicitly mentioned in the constitution but it has been recognized by supreme court as a constitutional right it's not so there is a difference legal rights are secondary compared to constitutional rights legal rights can be easily tampered with constitutional rights not so easy so right to marry enjoys the status of a constitutional right so this is a wrong statement okay so one only is the correct answer right hadia case okay so we move on next okay anti defection law so we have a big constitutional question before the supreme court about uh, interpretation of 10th schedule provisions right so there is a possibility of questions being asked so this is a simple question uh, next question might be slightly challenging okay provisions regarding anti defection law was introduced during the prime ministership of mrs indira gandhi is wrong it was during rajiv gandhi period 10th schedule was even added not during indira gandhi period first statement is wrong second statement is correct there are certain exemptions that are applicable exemptions are applicable to speaker deputy speaker and the deputy chairman of lok sabha and rajya sabha similarly for state legislatures as well so all the presiding officers which includes the deputy speaker of lok sabha they enjoy certain exemptions they can even resign from the political party on whose ticket they have contested and they have won an entry into the house okay it's something not only applicable to the speaker it is applicable to all these presiding officers okay so second statement is right this is a simple question not very difficult so we'll move on to the next question Okay, the question is asking which of the following statements are incorrect about uh, anti defection law provisions in the 10th schedule of the constitution of india okay c all right incorrect no breach of privileges makes a member of parliament liable to be disqualified under the provisions of anti defection law wrong breach of privileges will be dealt in a separate privilege motion has nothing to do with anti defection law okay a member disqualified can be appointed as a minister after he has got himself re elected to that house yes even though various bodies various commissions in the past have given recommendation on Uh, anybody who is disqualified should not be made as a minister throughout the tenure of the house but that is not what the present anti defection law provisions of the constitution say okay so right now a person if he is disqualified he has to once again contest election if he is able to win and get entry into the same house then yes there is no bar, bar on appointing him as a minister so second statement a member disqualified can be appointed as a minister after he has got himself elected to that house is a correct statement anti defection law provisions disqualify member of parliament on grounds of holding office of profit no that is a constitutional provision constitution says 
it is not in the in 10th schedule okay it is there in the articles regarding parliament union legislature from 79 to 123 in between that you will have those provisions where if you hold office of profit in that case you will be disqualified from being a member of parliament okay nothing to do with anti defection law so 1 and 3 are wrong statements okay so c is the right answer so many of you have got it right so the present debate that is going on centered around anti defection law is with respect to maharashtra issue where shiv sena uh, a, a big group okay more than two thirds of the members of shiv sena party they wanted to go and join with bjp they wanted to become alliance partners with bjp whereas uddhav thakre led faction they did not wanted to okay now that both the factions have split one section went and joined with bjp okay and while this was happening itself the then deputy speaker of maharashtra assembly had sent notices to this shinde faction okay notices why you should not be removed on grounds of defection okay but immediately shinde went to supreme court and got a stay saying that the deputy speaker has given me only 48 hours okay even in previous supreme court judgments a period of 7 days notice has to be given so 48 hours is too less and he was able to get the notice of speaker stayed by the supreme court and in the meanwhile the governor of maharashtra had con conducted a floor test because of which uddhav thakre had to resign as chief minister now shinde and uh, bjp they were able to team up together form a government okay and after that now what is the issue pending before the supreme court the issue is shiv sena shinde faction says that we are the majority rival faction he is the minority rival faction okay and we are the majority so we are who real shiv sena is he is the faction basically okay he is uh, uddhav thakre is the faction who have split from this group uddhav thakre is the one who should be disqualified and not us but the provisions of anti defection law it says that a party has to go and merge with another party only then they can be safeguarded from being disqualified now the biggest question before shiv sena faction of ekna chinde an election commission has also decided that ekna chinde faction is the real shiv sena okay now the question before ekna chinde is can they remain independently as shiv sena legislators or should they go and compulsorily merge themselves with bjp why because anti defection law provision say a party should merge itself if it breaks okay only if it merges then it can avail the exemption so now there is a constitutional bench which has been formed in supreme court which is looking into the matter okay so even in the course of hearing the arguments the chief justice of india has expressed his opinion whether it is majority faction or minority faction the wording of the constitution is open that whichever faction it is they have to merge themselves if they merge themselves the problem is shiv sena legislators will no longer be shiv sena legislators they have to take up the identity of bjp mlas shiv sena identity is completely gone okay so it's a constitutional case pending before the supreme court whether it is the smallest faction or every both the factions whether it is majority or minority factions to avail the exemption should they should a compulsorily a merger should be affected or not that is the case that is pending before the supreme court which has yet to be decided all right we move on next okay these are themes uh, regarding secularism about the hijab issue uniform civil code so all these are going on um, so you know what is the hijab ban that was imposed in karnataka in schools and it was challenged in high court high court had upheld the ban then again it went on challenge to supreme court supreme court it was a split verdict by a division bench of judges two judges have looked listened to the matter one said yes government is right other said government is not correct in imposing the ban okay so we have such issues going on with hijab and also the talk of bringing in uniform civil code and already there's a talk going on in various states that they will try to bring in uniform civil code so these are issues that are going on so let's have a look at the question and find out what is the issue so basically wearing hijab comes under freedom of religion so can the state impose restrictions on the free practice of religion or not that is the essential question right based on that this question has been framed what is are the correct provisions regarding right to freedom of religion in india okay
the restrictions to the practice of religion can be imposed by judiciary and not by the legislatures this is a wrong answer okay the judiciary will only check the reasonableness of restrictions imposed by the state it is the state state means parliament union legislature union executive state legislature state executive and other authorities so it is the state which can impose restrictions and the reasonableness of the restrictions will be tested by the judiciary okay so the first statement is wrong when it comes to entire fundamental rights chapter or wherever the restrictions can be placed on the exercise of fundamental rights it is the responsibility of the state and not that of judiciary to impose restrictions okay second statement is right when you read uh, the articles from 25 to 28 regarding freedom of religion you will find that these freedoms are not only available to individuals but also to denominations religious denominations groups of individuals as well denominations can hold property acquire property administer property okay so the uh, uh, freedom of religion is also available to denominations in, and groups not only simply to individuals so second statement is right first statement is wrong so two only is the correct answer okay see upsc will not ask you directly a question uh, wearing of ban on hijab is violative of which of the fundamental right because it is deemed to be not violative of any fundamental right okay because that is what the, is the judgment of high court and supreme court so there is no way a direct question on hijab issue or anything can be asked only indirectly whether you understand the concept of restrictions placed whether you understand the concept of secularism okay questions can be asked about the difference between indian secularism and the western secularism so all uh, those are the areas how upsc can test the underlying concept uh, in this issue so next let me see how many can get this question right this is a challenging question என்ன பா டிஸ்பிளே கரெக்டா வருதா பாதி பாதி வருது மாதிரி okay all those who have gone with d you are all correct okay so because you see judiciary has come up with all these principles in a different lot of cases okay those are all principles um, to test state action whether the state action is correct or not okay what is doctrine of proportionality that is a state action should only be proportional to the problem okay let's say uh taking out uh, ganesh Vin puja right vinayaka chaturthi processions outside a mosque can be become a law and order problem does it make sense to completely ban vinayaka chaturthi procession processions to, throughout the city that is excessive act whereas you can simply limit can change the route not allow ganesh chaturthi puja happening just outside that mosque alone this is a proportional act outright ban versus a regulated movement of the procession right so that is what is called as proportionality so if someone wants to take out ganesh puja as a part of their freedom of religion and if the state wants to impose restrictions on that the restriction should be proportional to the threat and problem it should not be excessive so yes judiciary uses doctrine of proportionality to evaluate state action the restrictions that is imposed by the state whether it is proportional to the problem or not it is used as a test doctrine of essential religious practice of course it is used as a test if state decides to ban hijab in the schools hijab is considered to be a non essential part of islam okay there are multiple high court judgments supreme court judgments where hijab the judges have interpreted that hijab doesn't form an essential practice of islam but if the state puts a ban on practice of namaz totally you cannot even practice namaz okay that will not be accepted because namaz is an essential part of islam you have to practice it five times a day or whatever the religion says correct similarly a hindu cannot be restricted from going and worshiping in a temple he uh, chanting mantras to deities is a essential part of hinduism the state cannot interfere with that okay but the state can always interfere and say law and order problem is there so you are not allowed to take processions taking processions is not an essential part of hinduism okay like that 
and what is doctrine of harmonious construction okay for example to take the case of uh, hijab it's, okay it's a conflict between uh, fundamental rights versus or not hijab issue okay you take the case of sacrifice of cow sacrifice of cow during bakrid okay during bakrid celebrations you want to slaughter cow sacrifice cow it it is a conflict between article 25 article 25 gives you the freedom of practice of religion whereas dpsp says the state shall take steps to protect milch cattle right so there is a conflict between these two provisions okay so the state because it has a responsibility to protect milch cattle it will place restrictions that you cannot sacrifice cow okay if at all it makes such restrictions it is violating such state restrictions violate article 25 okay but still the state restriction will be held as valid why because it gives effect to a dpsp that is how supreme court tries to harmoniously interpret two conflicting provisions of the constitution okay so yes even doctrine of harmonious construction is also a yardstick against which state restrictions on the free practice of religion gets tested okay so all the above is the right answer okay so some of you have got it right okay this is regarding uniform civil code uh, so based on that i have framed this question okay see those who are going with d you are just not uh, being careful okay article 25 is freedom of religion right you can manage your own religious affairs okay you can manage your own ways of how to marry how to divorce how to succeed how to inherit property okay all these comes under one community's own practice of their own affairs their own religion right a uniform civil code is actually interfering with that okay so article 25 cannot be the answer how can it be the answer so four should not be the answer 1 2 1 and 3 a uniform civil code gives a lot of rights it makes men and women equal when it comes to personal laws marriage divorce succession inheritance right it is making men and women equal so definitely 14 and 15 it is upheld okay now what about 21 it is because personal laws do not allow a person of one religion to marry a person of another religion okay there could be sanctions that follow uh, a marriage between a hindu and a muslim might not even be recognized as per the muslim personal laws and marriage that is why we have a, a, a special marriage act which is a uniform civil code basically on mar marriage issues okay so a person uh, right to marry okay it's a part of article 21 personal laws on marriage do not allow an individual to exercise the free choice of marrying whereas if you have a uniform civil code yes it allows people to marry freely so 14 15 21 all three are upheld if only we have a uniform civil code on personal laws okay So it's a simple question you just have to think and you have to eliminate 25 can definitely not be there 25 allows for every religion to have their own laws but we are trying to move beyond that by giving effect to the dpsp which mandates uh, which tries to bring in uniform civil code okay so this is how you'll have to think for this question okay so the next theme is regarding reservation yeah we have had the uh, Uh, constitutional amendment act 
passed, which provides reservation for economically weaker sections and which was also upheld by the Supreme Court. Okay. So UPSC will definitely not ask you a question, who are eligible to avail EWS reservation? Person with the land of so-and-so area, income criteria, that is all not UPSC's way of asking questions. Okay, UPSC goes to the constitution, finds out constitutional provisions which supports the idea of reservation itself. Okay, so this is a way of how UPSC probably can ask questions. Affirmative action such as reservations for SC and ST by the state can be attributed to which of the following parts of the constitution? Okay, most of the answers are right, correct answers. All the above, D is the right answer. See, Article 15, Article 16, they provide for safeguards to state policy that provides reservation. Okay, reservation is not a fundamental right. Article 15 and 16 do not ensure a mandatory reservation system for OBCs and SCs and STs. 15 and 16 say, if reservation is provided by the state, then that shall be pro protected. It shall not be challenged as violation to right of equality. So yes, this up, uh, this is it is by virtue of provisions in fundamental right in Article 15, 16, we do have affirmative action policies. Direct to principle, yes, we do have a direct to principle which says, which uh, puts a duty on the state to ensure the educational and economic interests of the backward class of citizens specifically the scheduled caste and scheduled tribe shall be protected. Okay, that is why the state first came up with reservation policy for OBCs, the Madras GO. Okay, first which was passed to give reservation for OBCs in government colleges, which was challenged in Champakam Durai Rajan case. That is all because, not because of any fundamental right provision. It's because of DPSP, which I'll ask, which puts a responsibility on the state to ensure educational and economic interests of backward class of citizens, especially Scheduled caste, scheduled tribe. So yes, there are provisions in DPSP which provides uh, support for reservation. And we do have special provisions for SCs, STs, Anglo-Indians. Now we don't have for Anglo-Indians, but SCs and STs, right? We have special provisions in these, uh, Article 330 onwards, 330 to 334, 335. Those are the articles which talks about special provisions for certain classes. In those articles, you have reservations for SCs and STs in state legislative assembly as well as Lok Sabha. Okay. And the claims of SCST in employment avenues, employment matters, that is also given. So it is all these three which are the reasons which support affirmative actions in the form of reservations. Okay, all the above is the right answer. Okay. The next question. See, it is simple. If you know what to be eliminated, the answer is simple. It may look like a lot of numbers and all, but it's actually not so difficult. A can never be the answer because, okay, 103rd is the amendment which provides for EWS. What are you, I, I think you're not thinking, okay. If you're thinking that 103rd Amendment Act is the reason why we have reservations, Definitely A should be there. So these cannot be the answer. It's a simple question. Either C or D. Okay, which of the following amendments have introduced provisions regarding reservation as a means of affirmative actions for the weaker sections? Okay. So I'm sorry, the choices is not correct. It should be one, two, three, and four. Okay, is it correct now? C. Yeah, 101st is GST. This is nothing to do with reservation, but all these are some important landmark uh, constitutional amendments, right? 103rd is for EWS, First Amendment Act. Can you remember? It introduced reservations for Article 15, 
sub clause 4 was introduced okay so this is very important for reservations for socially educationally backward class of citizens for scs sts in educational institutions so this is important 77th 73rd these are all 73rd is regarding panchayats reservations in panchayats correct reservations for scs sts in panchayats 77th is regarding reservations in promotions with consequential seniority which is there in article 16 all these were introduced so even if you would not know this is something that is excusable you need not know point number three but you should know 101st is gst some important amendments no you should have an idea about it 101st if you know it is gst you can exclude it if you exclude it phi should not be there in answer d should not be there b should not be there and one should be there so this is also not there it's very simple to get the answer just that i had uh, not given the correct option then so except for five all other amendments have relevance with reservations okay you should think like that okay next is regarding supreme court okay so we have had a lot of issues going on where the law minister have expressed his displeasure with the present collegium system so and already the, there was an attempt made in the form of 99th amendment act which was struck down by the judiciary right so based on that a few questions have been chosen okay so issues regarding judiciary i cannot confine it narrowly only to appointment of judges issues but there are certain other issues also which have been prominently in news in the recent days so regarding pil there was a dispute and uh, it went to the supreme court supreme court had given some judgments regarding the judicious use of PIL. Based on this, this question has been chosen. Okay, PILs cannot be filed. You know, what is the history of public interest litigation? I don't want to get go into that. Hussein Ara cartoon case first brought to the, uh, brought the idea of PIL, okay, where a public interest litigation was filed on behalf of the prison inmates in the state of Bihar. So it was brought to the notice of Supreme Court. Then Supreme Court gave relief, improved the conditions of living for prison inmates in Bihar. So we cannot discuss about every aspect of PIL, but uh, PIL was recently in news because the Supreme Court had made it clear that PILs cannot be filed by persons whose interests are affected due to state action or inaction. So let's say there is a there are thousand bus drivers. Okay, we are all a part of bus drivers. I am also a bus driver. State timely does not sanction our gratuity amounts when we got retired. Okay, if that is the case, we can all go and file individual writ petitions before the court. That my right to equality is violated. Somebody else is given a favorable treatment. I am not given my due share. The state is discriminating against me. I can file a red petition saying my fundamental right is violated. But I cannot go and file a public interest litigation for all the drivers. But if I'm not a driver, let's say I'm a conductor, okay? I can go and now file a public interest litigation on behalf of someone else. The essential idea is those whose interests lie in the litigation should not be a part of public interest litigation, okay? So this is something you should remember. So if your interest was also affected, then you do not have the right to file a public interest litigation. You can file your respective writ petitions. So this is wrong. This is right. So Supreme Court in the same judgment has asked all the high courts to devise their own rules regarding how to deal with public interest litigations. Every high court can have their own procedure. How many judges should dispose of public interest litigation on what day? What should be the form in which the the court can receive petitions. So regarding their own procedures, the high courts, every high court can make their own rules to deal with PILs. So two only is the right answer. This is a this is something that happened in the last six months only. Okay, maybe you can check out and read more on this. So B, Bombay is the right answer. Please explain pill again. Pill I cannot explain again because we don't have the time. Public interest litigation is basically how you move the court on behalf of someone else whose fundamental right has been violated because the state has failed to take care of their needs. That is public interest litigation, okay? Let's say a group of poor people are there. They are not given 
proper housing facility because of which they are just sleeping in the cold in the night time in the pavements so their fundamental right of housing right to have a shelter has been violated because the state is completely blind towards their needs so i am rich i don't i'm not affected by the state inaction okay now i can go and file a petition in the court saying that the fundamental right of article 21 of those people have been violated because of state inaction i am moving the court on behalf of someone else because there is a, a larger social interest which is being affected okay so if i was also a part of the group of people i cannot go and file a pil i can only go and file an individual writ petition on my own grievance that's the idea okay you cannot be a person who has been affected first statement is not correct okay pils cannot be filed oh yeah it's right right pils correct pils cannot be filed by persons whose interests are affected due to state action first statement is right second statement is right so c both is the right answer sorry okay next this is regarding the collegium system article 32 supports pils that is all fine why are you bringing all that here okay my only idea is who can file that petition if i am aggrieved by the state in action i cannot file a public interest litigation i can file my fundamental right has been violated this is what supreme court has said in a recent judgment okay where it was an appeal from karnataka okay it was an appeal from karnataka high court and the karnataka high court had also taken the same line karnataka high court had dismissed the petition public interest litigation that was filed on behalf of a class of people and the person who filed the petition was also part of that same group who were affected karnataka government dismissed it then they went on an appeal to supreme court and supreme court had also dismissed and it said that person whose interest is affected cannot file public interest litigation and it asked each high court to come up with its own procedures you don't have to prove locus standi sir in pil pil is it's, it happened only after locus standi has been liberalized you don't have to be the person whose interest has been affected okay so if i go and file a petition on behalf of some other people i my interest is not at all affected there is no concept of locus standi only in pil it has been liberalized okay moving question number 18 consider the following statements regarding collegium system for the appointment of judges to the supreme court okay the collegium was inserted into the constitution by an amendment no it is as a result of three judges cases and not because of a constitutional amendment no judge of the supreme court outside the collegium is to be consulted in recommending a suitable candidate to the president this is wrong okay where in the third judges case if you actually read the entire points of third judges case you'll understand the collegium is cji plus four senior most judges let's say the name of a judge who is being now considered is someone who is completely unfamiliar to all the five judges they have no idea about the antecedents of the judge whose name is now being considered a judge of high court is to be elevated to the supreme court and the collegium entire collegium they have no idea about the antecedents about the uh, performance of the judge okay in that case what can they do the third judges case has clarified whichever other judge of the supreme court who happens to be from the same bar okay from the same bar as that of the judge whose name is being considered his opinion should also be elicited okay so this is wrong a judge who is not a part of the collegium will can also be consulted okay 99th amendment act had attempted to increase the number of judges in the collegium no 99th amendment act had tried to bring in a new body replacing collegium itself a national judicial appointments commission was brought in and it was not an attempt to increase the size of collegium so none of the above is the right answer okay d d is the correct answer so very few answers d all right move on okay this is regarding a recent amendment that was brought in a bill has been introduced for the purpose it is yet to be enacted and to receive the presidential assent but a bill has been introduced to make changes to 
the multi state cooperative societies act of 2002 okay now that is to be amended all right so this is also connected to i think two years back supreme court had struck down certain provisions of 97th constitutional amendment act 97th amendment act had introduced provisions regarding cooperatives into the constitution but some portions of it were struck down by the court because it interferes with the power of the state to regulate cooperative state cooperatives okay but uh, since then no question was actually asked about uh, cooperatives and all that even that year last year no question was actually asked but now that a bill has been introduced in the parliament so as to make changes to the way multi state cooperative societies are being regulated it is time for us to know get something familiar about the bill okay so based on that this question has been framed very good many correct answers okay see the purpose of the bill is to streamline the way cooperatives which are having their operations in two or more states okay those cooperatives are called as multi state cooperatives whereas then there are cooperatives who have their operations only in one state they are state cooperatives state cooperatives are controlled regulated by state laws cooperatives which are having their operations in two or more states regulated by central law which is multi state cooperative societies act basically what is the purpose of all these acts it is to regulate the way appointments are made to the board of directors okay the board who is going to manage the decisions of the cooperative how who uh, will all members of the cooperatives have some democratic manner of choosing the members to the board or not many cooperatives are actually controlled by the elites of that community alone that is why to make sure the cooperatives are very democratic in their functioning we have all these interventions by the government okay that is one okay next is uh, to ensure their accounts are are properly audited okay their expenditures are all properly accounted for it is to stipulate all those regulations and control over the way cooperatives function that is why we have all these acts okay so the latest uh, amendment if you want to read more on that you can read the prs okay prs brief uh, which we will discuss more about the provisions of the act so yes the amendment provision is the bill comes up with a, a new fund okay and what is the uh, fund purpose for all the sick cooperatives they are all sick because they don't have fresh fund infusion okay they are not having funds to even carry out their daily operations because of that so many cooperatives are not able to function effectively so to ensure that they are once again revitalized that is why you, government has to infuse money but government doesn't have money that is why the amendment is brought now so that all the profit making cooperatives have to give certain percentage i think one percentage of their annual profits must be pulled into the fund or if not 1% then 1 crore whichever is the lower amount okay whichever is lower for example amul 1 crore is very less 1% of its profits might itself come to 15 20 crores okay so whichever is uh, uh, sorry whichever is higher not lower 1% of its annual profits or uh, 1 crore okay whichever is higher all the multi state cooperatives they must pool they must form a fund that fund will be used to support all the weak cooperatives okay so that is one objective of this bill next is the bill prohibits government shareholding in multi state cooperatives no there is no such provision government will always be if it wants the government can always infuse fund and it can also become a shareholder okay so there is nothing in the bill or in the previous bill or in the present amendment bill nowhere is there any prohibition stopping government from becoming a shareholder in the management of a cooperative society so this is wrong the bill allows the merger of state cooperatives yes if various sick state cooperatives which are not functioning properly 
okay if subject to the state laws state cooperatives who has the power to regulate their affairs it is the state government so central government cannot unilaterally make this act and say that we will merge state cooperatives into a multi state cooperative that is not possible okay that is why even in the amendment bill it is now given if the state laws regarding cooperatives allows such a merger okay subject to the provisions of state laws in that case if the board of the cooperative the board of management of the cooperative society if they decide that we have to merge ourselves with a healthy bigger multi state cooperative society then yes it allows for merger of those cooperatives okay and then there are many other points where uh, the amendment provides for creation of a ombudsman okay ombudsman is a dispute resolution authority creation of a ombudsman regarding disputes so all those kind of uh, other features are also there in the bill you can have a look at it but uh, yes the correct answer is 1 and 3 for this question okay and then there are some issues also regarding it which will may not be asked for prelims but can be asked later in means so prs is the go to place to read whatever is relevant regarding this particular topic okay so this is regarding the constitutional provisions regarding cooperatives okay very good a lot of correct answers surprising that uh, many of you know the correct answer for this question very good so yes these are all just constitutional provisions regarding cooperatives okay you read the provisions inserted by 97th amendment act which has brought in a lot of provisions regarding cooperatives just go and have a broad look at them you will get the answer for this it is not the central government it is basically state government state government has the power to appoint uh, authorities for auditing the accounts of the cooperatives not the center okay for those who have said the statement this is wrong so some of you have said this statement also as wrong if that is the case may i know the correct answer why did you say that this statement is wrong if state election commission is not responsible for conducting elections to cooperative societies in the state then who is responsible then they themselves okay state legislature that's all correct a step, separate body will be constituted correct okay we have a state cooperative election commission separately okay uh, the constitution allows the state legislature to constitute a separate body so every state legislature they would have constitute their own body so it is not state election commission which has the power of holding elections to cooperate so it is a separate state cooperative election commission okay so on their own that's very good that's also correct so first statement is wrong second statement is also wrong okay so none none is the correct answer okay next federalism center state related issues this year i i'm i i did not come across much federal conflicts between center and state last year we had farm laws and all that okay this year we don't really have any conflicts as such between center and state or between a group of states of course regular boundary disputes resource sharing disputes they'll all be there but uh, nothing prominent happening in the area of federalism in the last one year okay very difficult to come across a current affair so i have chosen two questions one is from gst council because the court in the last year's july month had given a judgment saying that gst council decisions are not binding on the states so based on that some question has been framed and uh, recently the zonal council meeting was held okay the eastern zonal council meeting was held these are the only things that i was able to come regarding federalism these are the questions the question is incorrect i think most of you are going for correct answers
in your exam please read the question correctly don't make all these silly mistakes which makes you repent one attempt is wasted there will be five six questions cumulatively if you start making all these kind of silly mistakes where you don't notice whether it's correct or incorrect and all that okay it's incorrect there are six zonal councils in india is it correct can someone tell me is there six are there six zonal councils in india there are only five are zonal councils constitutional bodies no they are statutory bodies created by states reorganization act chairman of each zonal council is the cm of one of the member states is it so no union home minister okay so this is also wrong sikkim is not a member of the eastern zonal council okay this is also wrong sikkim is a member of eastern zonal council okay so the meeting of the eastern zonal council was recently concluded okay so you can find it out when i was browsing about it many upsc websites you know they are giving wrong answers sikkim is not a part of eastern zonal council they brought sikkim as a northeastern state and they linked it with northeastern council okay when you go through government pib sikkim is also a part of eastern zonal council okay so all the statements are wrong so d all the above is the correct answer all right we move on this is regarding gst okay first question I, i i think this one i have already told you supreme court judgment decisions of gst council is not binding on state governments gst council is simply an advisory body it can only advise the parliament as well as the states on how to make laws okay can state governments make laws related to gst can they do that yes they can except for gst on interstate trade and commerce for gst on commerce happening within that particular state itself state legislatures can also make laws so it is a power given under article 246a of the constitution where both parliament and state legislatures can make laws regarding gst so state legislatures can make laws otherwise why would gst council advise the state governments it is regarding when the state governments make laws on gst they get advice okay so first statement is wrong second statement is correct okay either b or d center has a greater vote to weight age in gst council than all the states combined together is this correct no not correct okay center share is only one third all the states put together they have two third weight age so center cannot have more weight age than the states so third is wrong so only two only is the correct answer 22 option b is the correct answer so that's it about federalism okay we move on to certain bodies and agencies which were in news i could come across these bodies which were repeatedly in news and now prime minister has also made a mention of enforcement directorate and all so you can expect a question about ed enforcement directorate okay so let's have a look two questions from this part bodies and agencies which are recently in news see i really don't think election uh, simplest question of election commission will be asked election commission is more prominent this year than last year especially after the judgment of supreme court regarding appointment of election commissioners but to simply asking the methodology of appointment of election commissioners would be a very simple question i don't even have to teach you you guys know it already so i don't think upsc will also make it so trivial the question okay so if this is the question then what is the answer Okay, we have multiple answers basically all these are features of 
not of the constitution these are all provisions of election commission duties functions and conditions of service act okay when you read article 324 of the constitution the constitution gives power in the hands of parliament to make law to prescribe the duties functions and to regulate the conditions of service of the election commissioners okay so it, these are all taken out from the act directly okay so what are the correct answers decisions are taken by majority that's correct when you read the act it says preferably by consensus if not by consensus then at least by majority okay the chief election commissioner has the power of veto no not given in the act and the supreme court has decided in a case okay the chief election commissioner was the union of india it's called as the tn sessions case in 90s supreme court has clearly decided that uh, see uh, chief election commissioner as prime as inter paris that is he is the first among the equals and he doesn't have the power of vetoing the decisions taken by the other election commissioners so you should not think his role as that of chief justice of india okay no similar comparison so this is not the case constitution does not prescribe a tenure it is only prescribed in the act not in the constitution so the correct answer is one only a is the correct answer fine we move on to the next question which act uh, just search I, i don't know the exact name of the act only election commission duties powers functions and conditions of service act if possible just search on those lines you will get the act okay b d all right see the nodal agency to enforce the provisions of pmla is not income tax it is the enforcement directorate there can be no prosecution under the act unless money laundering has been committed is a correct statement okay so two only is the correct answer you should not simply choose d none i i don't know why you have gone for d you see without knowing please don't attempt okay and especially these kind of questions two options have eliminated why do you have to simply attempt it okay when you read prevention of money laundering act there are three conditions which have to be satisfied only then prosecution in the court can happen this was a news the harsh provision of pmla was challenged in supreme court okay because uh, property attachment clauses were there so many people they lose control of their property crows and crows of property gets attached so it was challenged in the supreme court it was all happening in the last 8 months okay supreme court has allowed the provisions to exist so there is a possibility and moreover prime minister has also made a speech about uh, enforcement directorate so who knows there could be some question regarding it it's better to skip this question okay if you don't know but uh, see for actions to be taken under prevention of money laundering act three conditions must be satisfied first is there should be an illegal activity committed okay what is an illegal activity it could be sale of guns it could be sale of drugs opium smuggling of animal parts okay some illegal activity should have been committed that is why if you read the provisions of prevention of money laundering act the act is indexed to many other acts it is indexed to narcotic narcotics and psychotropic substances act it is indexed to arms act it is indexed to wildlife protection act so first you should have done an offense under any of the different acts that are found in the schedule of prevention of money laundering act second that illegal activity must have given you some money you should have earned some money out of the illegal activity and third the money should have been laundered okay there should have been an attempt to convert this black money into a white money because you cannot if you do a business you have to disclose what is the business to the income tax department but if you smuggle you cannot disclose what is the income right so you have only black money with you and now you make an attempt to launder it by showing it as if you have earned it from some other sources right these three essential conditions all of them should be satisfied 
because if you simply only have smuggled okay you have just smuggled you will be prosecuted against the respective and under the respective acts not under pmla under prevention of money laundering act these three conditions must be satisfied right so better to skip these kind of questions if you are not aware of it the correct answer is two only b there can be so much more features of this act okay but that is not the purpose of the session where i can teach you each and every act that is in news no you, you it's your responsibility to go and read further about it just a broad exposure to uh, this topic okay all right so next we have had a lot of uh, activities going on in parliament because of lot of recently we come across members of parliament just like that they are suspended okay because they raised protest against the ruling party in rajya sabha some members of congress were suspended so suspension of members we come across then rahul gandhi was even disqualified from being a member of lok sabha when rahul gandhi flashed the photograph of uh, prime minister modi sitting along with adani bjp tried to bring in a privilege motion against rahul gandhi correct and rajya sabha had uh, formed a committee okay i am forget the name of the committee rama acharyalu committee he was a former secretary general of rajya sabha under his leadership a committee was formed to suggest reforms in rajya sabha these are all some recent happenings surrounding parliament okay whatever has I, i was able to come across in the last one years of news regarding parliament so based on that a few questions have been framed so this is a question framed because of the recommendations made by this committee formed in rajya sabha to suggest reforms in rajya sabha based on that uh, i have framed this question okay see if you can answer this Uh, i think it's ram acharyalu okay not sure about it exactly what it is just spotted it once he was a former secretary general of rajya sabha under his leadership maybe search it ram acharya maybe tel telugu person that's why ram acharyalu okay the deputy chairman is not a member of general purpose committee it's a wrong answer chairman chairman of rajya sabha deputy chairman they are all a part of general purpose committee okay so this is wrong tenure of members of the committee is for a period of 1 year is wrong again okay it is throughout the tenure of the house unless the member resigns himself or his seat in the committee becomes vacant okay so it is not a tenure of 1 year it is usually it is those committees which holds the government accountable for its actions which has a membership of one year okay like pac department related standing committee committee on government assurances if you see in all those committees you will have a fixed tenure okay but uh, when it comes to these kind of committees regarding rules making rules for the house business advisory committee we don't have fixed one year membership and all that okay it's not for a period of one year and members of the committee are elected by the members from amongst themselves that is also wrong they are to be nominated by the chairman they are not going to be elected from amongst themselves and all no that is not the case okay and uh, general purpose committee does not have a maximum cap on number of members and all because it's a very interesting committee general purpose committee no who are the members every leader of every political party is all a part of that committee whereas you see rules committee uh, business advisory committee of rajya sabha all that will have fixed membership 15 members 10 members okay general purpose committee whatever political parties are there all their leaders are all a member of the committee okay so every function that is not performed by other committees will all be taken up by this general purpose committee so all three statements are incorrect d is the right answer you should ideally skip this question why are you even attempting this okay don't try to attempt everything just to try to skip if you are not aware of it okay this is regarding lok sabha question has been framed regarding uh, many members of lok sabha being suspended chairman is also a member of general purpose committee
only mps are usually members of committees where did you learn that not really to set the business of the house the ch- who else than the chairman the chairman has to be similarly speaker has to be in lok sabha chairman of rajya sabha has to be a member of business advisory committee not necessary only mps will be members okay the speaker of lok sabha can suspend a member of lok sabha for a maximum period of 10 days only and uh, people are saying that it is wrong why is it wrong anybody can tell me why uh, why are you saying that this wrong all of you are getting a try it very surprising so where do you learn it and why do you say it's wrong yeah throughout that session not indefinite period only for the entire session okay don't uh, think it's for an indefinite period maximum up to the end of that session okay questions for which notices had been given by the member so suspended have to be answered even if the member remains suspended no this is also incorrect if he suspended all the questions that he has given a notice for need not even be answered okay so second statement is also wrong none this is regarding the procedures uh, given in rules of procedure of lok sabha about suspension of members okay you may have a look at uh, rules of procedure to find out on what all grounds a member can be suspended okay he can be suspended for breach of privileges he can be suspended for uh, unruly behavior in the house frequent obstruction not allowing the house to function okay so just get an idea about it okay let me see if you can get this question right if a deputy chairman is appointed as a member of a committee he has to be a chairman of the committee right i am not sure about it mm not sure maybe you can check it out from rules of procedure of uh, rajya sabha mps of lok sabha okay this is regarding uh, misuse and abuse of privileges okay so since that privilege issue was there in news mps of lok sabha do not enjoy privileges related to speech and expression outside the parliament is correct when you read article 105 the wording of 105 is there shall be freedom of speech and expression in the parliament okay so outside the parliament you do not you are just like common man for whatever you say you are liable for your speeches okay see rahul gandhi under defamation laws he has been convicted why because he does not enjoy that absolute freedom of speech and expression outside the parliament inside the parliament yes he enjoys okay freedom of speech available to the members of the lok sabha inside the house is not an absolute freedom and can be restricted this is also correct okay both c is the right answer the reason is because if you read 105 of the constitution it says subject to the other provisions of the constitution there shall be freedom of speech and expression in the houses of parliament so subject to other provisions okay you cannot speak things that disturb communal harmony create problems to public order okay so subject to the other provisions of the constitution so it means that yes restrictions can be imposed by standing orders of the house by rules of the house or by laws made by parliament okay so yes restrictions can be imposed it's not that a member of parliament can simply stand up and speak bad words in the parliament that is not allowed because it is against decency and morals okay so both statements are correct so c is the answer okay you want to see the 26th question okay all right okay so we moved to the 28th question it's regarding it act it rules which is also in news so i'm sure you will all you would have all learned about uh, the provisions of it rules why is it subjudice before the supreme court now okay uh, what is the recent news about it rules the recent news is that central government had made even more stronger provisions in it rules so that the central government can now have the power to fact check 
okay it can fact check if it finds that a fact against the government is a false propaganda it can ask twitter or instagram or youtube to remove the content if they fail to remove the content then the safe harbor protection that these third party intermediaries enjoy under the it act will no longer be enjoyed by them they can also be prosecuted for failure for uh, sharing such hosting such content on their platforms right so that is why there is a protest happening from the media circles that uh, it is a attempt by the state to arm twist media okay right now if i share a content against the government i am liable twitter is not liable but if the government finds that this is a false propaganda against the government and if it asks twitter to remove it if twitter refuses to remove in that case twitter itself will be prosecuted in the court okay so basically they are uh, the safe harbor protection will be taken out for twitter if they fail to comply with it so such kind of uh, very tighter rules have been brought in in it rules by the latest amendment to it rules so it is in news but the question is not about the features and issues and all that that you will have anyway studied okay a slightly different question let's see if you can get this right okay skip good learn to skip it may not be uh, rewarding in the short term but in the long term it will definitely reward you okay. three only is the blatantly wrong answer okay this is actually this is what is it rules why did the ministry of electronics and information technology meti how where from where did they get the power to notify these rules any idea how did the ministry of electronics get the power to notify these rules it is by virtue of the it act it act confers this power in the hands of the executive so it is a clear example of delegated legislation okay delegated legislation is the power of law making has been given away from the hands of parliament by a parliamentary law itself in the hands of a subordinate agency could be the executive okay so first it's a clear example of delegated legislation second it is as a result of rbi act rbi act confers the power in the hands of central government to issue a notification and declare certain currency notes as invalid it is as a result of that central government exercises this power this is also a part of it this is not by virtue of any law made by parliament this is by virtue of the constitution provision itself okay this is not a power handed over by parliament in the hands of another agency that is not the case okay the power of supreme court to frame rules regarding the procedure for dealing with petitions in the court all that is a power given in the constitution itself okay not a part of law so one and two is the correct answer so few of you have got it right b bombay is the right answer okay we move on last two questions uh, this is regarding some acts which are recently in news okay and uh, one more thing upsc in the last 2 3 years no they are not asking provisions of any recently recent legislation so that is why i have skipped and not only skipped there were not many recent amendments or uh, recent newly introduced bills in the last one year i was just checking uh, not very important bills have been introduced or anything okay so if you can come across such bills and study then you please study the features and all but i don't know to what extent it will be useful in your exam however i have framed some questions from recently introduced amendments to certain acts okay one is uh, the electricity act amendment bill what is the answer yes this is how it will be you will end up skipping if you do not know the exact provisions 
and uh, only very few acts are there okay and it is no guarantee that upsc will only ask about the last one year acts you can even ask last three years acts four years acts we cannot keep on predicting and preparing for every part of that i think the risk reward ratio is the effort reward ratio is very minimal okay so i would leave it to you to decide whether you want to go through all these provisions and all or not so the electricity act tries to uh, the amendment bill which is introduced it tries to make changes to a 20 year old act electricity act of 2000 okay so the current electricity generation distribution regulation all that is done based on a 20 year old act okay so that is why an amendment is now introduced maybe i am not sure whether it's 2000 or 2005 or 2002 but it's a quite a old act okay electricity act so that is why amendment is being introduced now okay it's a 2002 act all right thank you so uh it tries to rectify a biggest one big problem of electricity sector the big problem of electricity sector is in regulation of the sector okay see wherever you have private participants generating transmitting and distributing electricity you need to have an independent regulatory authority okay if you have state alone generating state alone transmitting state alone distributing you don't need a regulatory body this is the case in tamil nadu the state itself does all the activities maybe in generation we may be outsourcing and buying it from private producers but a transmission distribution done by the state in tamil nadu so we don't have electricity regulatory commission but you go to other states you have regulatory commissions but these regulatory commissions are crippled crippled for want of independence for want of financial powers okay and uh, political interference in appointments of members and chairmen to these regulatory bodies that is why an attempt is made in the form of introducing these amendments to ensure to streamline the process of appointment of members to these regulatory bodies so one way of how it is supposed to be streamlined is by giving more powers in the hand of center to appoint the members and the chairmen of state electricity regulatory commission so that is why certain states have been crying that uh, it violates the federal pr- principle electricity is in concurrent list so both of us have powers why are you interfering with our power to make appointments to electricity regulatory commissions so this is becoming an issue uh, but the purpose of the act is definitely it increases the role of center in appointment of members okay the bill abolishes abo- appellate tribunal for electricity is wrong the bill creates an appellate tribunal for electricity so if there are disputes you can take it to regulatory body still dispute you can take it to the appellate tribunals so second statement is wrong sorry first statement is wrong second statement is correct so two only is the correct answer so surprising a few of you have even got it right also okay that's good uh, so this is and there are, there could be many other features of electricity uh, act amendment bill 2023 maybe you can have a look at it and lastly this is a, a forest conservation act amendment bill has been introduced in the parliament but the question is not asked from the amendment bill it is asked from the parent bill itself but if you know the provisions of amendment bill you will be able to get this question right from the parent act okay so the question is not actually from the amendment bill but uh, the provisions of the parent act which is supposed to be amended in the amendment bill so i have directly gone to the provisions which are attempted to be amend- amended okay so 28th question okay i'll show you once this is displayed once this is done i'll show you the 28th question the forest conservation act was passed uh, to regulate the diversion of forest lands for non forest purpose okay because there will be necessity for using forest land excess land is there no in forest land except for the core areas protected areas there are certain parts of the forest which are necessary to be used for certain other activities which are non forest in nature so when you divert the land for other purposes let's say highway construction okay what should you do to compensate for it you have the act called as forest conservation act which provides the uh, ways to deal with such diversion okay it regulates such diversion basically and for what all activities can it be diverted it is those provisions are there in forest conservation act can you think of what all activities would amount to 
diversion of forest lands for non forest purposes what all would come probably under non forest purposes okay mining dams okay those activities are prohibited you cannot carry out those activities in forest lands okay in uh, certain protected forest lands all you cannot carry out those activities but uh, there could be a necessity to lay railway lines there could be a necessity to lay a uh, check posts okay a forest beat posts have to be put in or a camp has to be constructed for paramilitary forces who are stationed in left wing extremist affected areas there you have to clear forest make a 100 acre camp okay environmentally completely degrading activities no they are not allowed at all but uh, some activities like these kind of activities in the larger interest of security in the interest of mobility connectivity so such kind of projects can be taken up under forest conservation act that is after getting the consent of the center okay now the purpose of forest conservation act amendment bill which is introduced now is to expand the scope of those activities if you read the recent amendment bill which is introduced it tries to bring in some more activities which can be taken up for example establishing zoos establishing safari parks you no know, wildlife park uh, parks in forest areas for those purposes also now forest land can be diverted for non forest purposes okay to build eco tourism initiatives yes the land can be diverted okay so basically creating zoos is a part of the latest amendment bill not a part of the parent act so that is why the question has been asked this is not a part of the forest conservation act it is a part of the latest amendment it is since it is not there that is why the amendment itself is being proposed okay so one should not be there leasing out forest land for private entities for non forest purposes is pub it is allowed after getting the consent of the center okay after getting the consent of the center for certain activities forest lands can be diverted for non forest purposes okay so second statement is right first statement is wrong so two only is the correct answer all right so these are the important bills latest laws that i can come across somebody asked me for 28th question okay justice nagaratna in the child case recognize child privacy i don't know about that okay i don't know right to privacy is explicitly mentioned in the un convention on child rights okay there could be a clause in the convention which says that the privacy of the child should be protected in certain cases and all that okay but uh, where there is a explicit mention that right to privacy is a part of these rights okay i didn't use the word privacy should be ensured in which all cases i said a right to privacy is different from ensuring privacy in certain occasions both are two different things okay question number 27 so may i know your performance were you able to but uh, looking at your amazing answers i feel many of you would have got at least 20 questions right because i see some people giving me all right answers okay so very encouraging in the sense uh, you going in the right direction if you can get all these kind of questions right you are able to think logically you are able to deconstruct the problem somehow find your way in the answers all these are skills that will matter in your real problems okay okay 8 out of 30 14 out of 29 21 correct 7 wrong 11 out of 30 15 right 8 wrong 7 left that is good 16 out of 30 okay less than 50% missing out technicality is 12 out of 30 it's okay you see for those who are getting less than 50% no keep working you still have two more months face these kind of questions improve precision uh, make sure you develop discipline of leaving questions unattempted don't be tempted to attempt questions unnecessarily right so keep doing all that Uh, it's a slow process okay with the time naturally the improvement will be seen okay 
it's okay to perfectly not i mean it's okay to not get even 10 questions right also as i told you these form the difficult questions in polity and only four questions out of 10 questions if it is asked will be of this nature six questions will be simple make sure you don't leave out on those six questions at all even that all even that way you can ensure seven questions out of 10 questions are right in polity okay that itself is enough if you can manage a decent attempt in other areas okay but uh, this is basically to give you an exposure to all the difficult kind of questions okay to make you think train yourself how to uh, even get these kind of questions get the confidence to face all these kind of questions but many of you have outperformed i would say the continuous correct answers okay all right i think we are done with the session so make use of the other sessions also okay every friday monday we'll be having other sessions all right okay uh okay yeah get the vibe back and uh, make sure you clear prelims okay by now it's been one year since you attended the classes for old students uh, good that you attempted the session you do not take it complacent and you do not feel that you know theriyada polity okay so it is good that you are here and uh, face similar questions similar sessions sharpen your skills ace your prelims all right i'll okay i'll share the ppt with all of you to all your registered mail id if possible i'll also attach ask the academy to attach a link of this ppt in the youtube channel also right okay thank you all the best